Alleluia. The Lord is risen. So if the Lord is risen as we proclaim, well, first he had to be dead. There must have been a death. And as we know, throughout history, reports of people's death have popped up with surprising regularity and, and, well, with sometimes humorous results. Mark Twain responded to a reporter's inquiry by saying, even I have heard on good authority that I was dead. The report of my death was an exaggeration. Other recent celebrities have had to defend the fact that they are still breathing. There was Sean Connery, Celine Dion, Sylvester Stallone, Betty White. Apparently, Betty White gets that every year. <laughs> but the best example took place 50 years ago. In 1969, a rumor began to fly around the world, Paul is dead. Many people were convinced that the rock star Paul McCartney had died in 1966 and had been replaced by a look-alike for a few years. Now, I'm not going to ask anyone to raise their hand, but I suspect there might be a few people in this crowd who did, in fact, play the song from the White Album backwards, certain listening for a message that said, turn on the on dead man. We listened to Strawberry Fields forever and thought we heard John Lennon saying, I buried Paul. <laughs> People searched the cover of the Abbey Road album for signs that maybe that wasn't really Paul in the picture. It probably was the greatest um, example of false identifications of someone's death, and Paul McCartney is still making music and touring 50 years later. But for centuries, the question has been asked and debated, was Jesus dead? And our scriptures try to make that as clear as possible. For on one desperate Friday, the friends of Jesus, including the women who had been with him since Galilee, stood at a safe distance from the cross and watched him die. And then Joseph of Arimathea, he took the body off the cross and he wrapped it in linen cloth and he laid it in a tomb that was carved out of rock and they rolled a massive stone over the entrance. And I think it helps us a little bit to remember that the people of Jesus' day lived with death. These were rough times. There was no sweeping bodies off to a mortuary quickly. They knew what dead looked like. They weren't fooled. His death was not a rumor. Jesus was wrapped in a linen cloth and laid in a tomb and waiting for the Sabbath to be over so the appropriate funeral rites could be continued. And the women watched and they prepared the spices and the ointments that would be put on his body. And early that Easter morning, the women walked to the tomb, wordless, their hearts muted with grief. And with their spices they had prepared, they walked expecting death, not life. When they arrived to anoint the body, they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, and when they ran inside, there was not a body to be found. But what appeared to be two men in dazzling bright clothes were there and they were shocked and they were confused as the men confronted them with what should be good news. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He has risen. Don't you remember how he told you back when you were in Galilee that the Son of Man would be handed over and crucified and on the third day rise again? Now this was Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Joanna and the women who were with them and they ran and they told the other apostles what they had seen. These were well-known, well-trusted women in the community of Jesus' followers. And yet they were unable to convince their friends. Their words seemed to the apostles to be an idle tale and most of the men lent their words no credence whatsoever, we are told. So apparently not listening to and believing women is a problem of the ages. 
that's for another sermon. We will continue. It was only Peter who ran to the tomb to see the evidence for himself. And then he went home amazed at what had happened. And he was amazed, but he was still confused. And it would take quite some time for Peter and any of the other of the followers to grasp what had happened and to make some sense of it and to find a way to move forward. But we do find in the book of Acts that Peter did find his voice, find a way, and he spoke up with a clear understanding of this message. When he says, truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who respects God and does what is right is acceptable. For you know the message God sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace in Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. Finally, we find Peter answering that question, what does this resurrection mean? But this well-thought-out answer doesn't take form right after the empty tomb. Even after Jesus appears to his friends and his followers, it forms gradually, much later. Peter's understanding emerges out of much internal struggle, many sleepless nights, one wild dream, and it emerges out of a relationship with a foreigner. For Cornelius was an Italian military officer. He was someone that a Jewish teacher at that time would have nothing to do with. And this man came looking for Peter's help. And by the time he met Cornelius, he had seen the risen Christ. He had gradually been drawn out of the shadows of his fear. He experienced the Spirit of God beginning to change his life. But he still hadn't given up those restrictive beliefs about who God could forgive. How far can the love of God reach? But in this relationship with a non-Jewish, non-Christian stranger, Peter's heart was open to the fullness, the full meaning of resurrection. God loves without limit, with no reservations. And when we really get this and grasp this ourselves, God won't let us hold this love back from anyone. The message of the resurrection as Jesus understood it was that Jesus had been murdered, unjustly killed as a criminal. He was raised from the dead by God. This resurrection of Jesus was world-shaking. It was paradigm-changing. It changes the way that we relate to one another. It breaks down our barriers. Destroying our desire to divide the world into us versus them. For resurrection is a sign. A sign opening us up to a vision of God's new creation that is coming into completion and is already working in the world in hidden ways sometimes. Wherever and whenever people seek peace over violence and love, over hate. This resurrection life is conquering death. So the resurrection validated Jesus' claims that the kingdom of God, God's realm of compassionate justice and joyful new life is already here in our midst. This is what resurrection meant to the early church. But more important than what they said that it meant was the fact that their message was backed up with the way that they lived their lives. Their words and their actions teach us that new life is not limited to this one Easter morning. Instead, it continues in and through our words and our actions today. They lived out the meaning of the words that they spoke by extending God's gracious welcome to all and by their mutual love and acceptance of one another, 
They went out from those times of prayer and worship and study, seeking to live out the compassion and reconciliation of God's kingdom in every part of their lives. Resurrection is experienced whenever we focus on life instead of death. Resurrection gives us the strength to move beyond the emotional fatigue that comes from seeing so much public pain. We all know too well that everyone has pain in their own lives, in their family lives, and yet Easter is a desperately needed reminder each and every year that pain and loss and death do not have the final say. A recent example is seen in a documentary that some of you may have watched on the life of Fred Rogers, favorite children's television star, who was also a Presbyterian minister, and his faith infused all the lessons that he tried to teach to children. And he kept his focus on the living, not the dead, especially in situations of tragedy and suffering that he wanted to explain to the children who waited for his words. This insight came from his own childhood. When he saw scary things on the news, his mother said to him, look for the helpers. You will always find people helping. To this day, he said, especially in times of disaster, I remember my mother's words, and I am always comforted by realizing that there are still so many helpers. There are so many people who are caring in this world. So the resurrection story is a story of hope. This story on this day gives us hope that although there will be times when we may not be able to see beyond our own hurts or our brokenness or our failure, there is something greater, more loving and more powerful than anything that we can see. This story today gives us hope that although the world may be filled with death and despair and sometimes all seems lost, renewal is already happening. The seed of divine love has been planted in the ground and God is doing something new in our lives and in the world. Even this morning, as I drank my coffee to get this day started and looked at the news, there were desperate stories of bombings of churches in Sri Lanka. And there was a story of a policeman who decided to change expectations. As he pulled over a young man in a car whose registration was behind, and the young man explained that he was on his way to a job interview so that he could get a job. And instead of arresting him, the police officer gave him a ride to his job interview, and he got his job, and he will be able to take care of his child. There are moments of great despair, and there are moments where transformation is happening each and every day. Jesus' resurrection changes the natural order of things. It changes our belief in the power of coercive power over weakness and death over life and fear over love. And when we grasp this truth, it will continually challenge us to examine our faith anew as Peter examined his. For Peter, the meaning of the resurrection included the shattering of old social boundaries, as he finally, gradually came to understand that Christ is Lord of all and no one is excluded from the love of God. The resurrection provides the promise that death is not the end of life. The creative power that brought the universe into being, that power that breathed life into our bodies, has the power to recreate 
and renew everything, including us. And this is what we see, and this is what we celebrate this day in the resurrection of Jesus. So, alleluia. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed, and this is why we sing.